Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on the last talk for today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Brett Slacking, who's a software engineer at Google, who's going to be talking to you about fan in and fan out. A big round of applause, please. Cool. All right, thanks very much. Uh, we'll just go right into it then. Uh, OK, so here's our agenda today. I'm going to tell you what the goal of this talk is. Uh, I'm going to provide some definitions. Um, I'm going to tell you the old way of doing things. Then I'm going to tell you about the new way of doing things. And then I'm going to show you how this is a pattern uh, that's everywhere. Uh, at the very end, I'll show you some links. The one thing I forgot to say was this talk is fan in and fan out, the crucial components of concurrency. We're talking about concurrency. Um, for reference, there's going to be a lot of code in this talk. If you can't see the screen, I already tested I think you'll be able to see it back there. But if you can't, if you go on my GitHub, GitHub bslackkin, I have the slides and all the code up there right now. So just load it on your laptop. You can follow along if you have a problem. Uh, and this is where you can find me. OK, so this is the goal of my talk. Uh, why do we need TULIP? Uh, TULIP, otherwise known as PEP3156, the Python Enhancement Proposal 3156, uh, otherwise known as the Async I.O. module. Um, so I can't really see that well, but uh, can I have a quick show of hands? Who's heard of this PEP TULIP or the? OK, so that's like a lot of people. That's great. You'd expect that. How many people have actually used it, like known they've used it? Three, three four people. OK. So, OK, yeah, Guido's like freaking out. OK, yeah, so Guido has used it. That's good. Um, OK, so I'm going to try to answer this today. Um, the first thing I think is that we'd all agree that uh, it's really easy to do things in Python. Uh, I think we'd all agree that it's straightforward to do things of a pretty good m amount of difficulty with Python. Uh, you can do concurrent work. You can do a lot of, uh, a lot of work in a single process uh, program. I think that the problem is that it's very hard to do a lot of different kinds of work at the same time for many different customers in one Python program. And I'll show you what that means. And the whole point of Tulip is it makes that trivial. So it makes it so that Python has a built-in tool in the toolbox that makes it trivial for a Python program to be doing a whole bunch of different things all at the same time concurrently. And when I talk about concurrency, I'm not talking about um, CPUs. I'm not talking about parallelism. I'm not talking about the GIL, the global interpreter lock that people talk about at this conference. I'm talking about concurrency, which is doing and managing state for many, many different things all at the same time. And I'll get into what that means. OK, some quick definitions so we're all on the same page. Fan out. What is fan out? It's when one thread of control spawns one or more new threads of control. So there's a lot of different ways to think about this. Um, one is that you send an email, and it can go and deliver that email to a whole bunch of different people. Or you send a tweet, and it delivers that to all the different mailboxes. Or it could be you write uh, to a database row, and you write out all the secondary indexes. Or you could spawn subprocesses to manage different uh, parts of subdirectories in some kind of management scheme. So one thread spawns many other threads, fan out. Fan in is the other side. It's when one thread of control gathers all of the results from these other threads. Okay? So you have all these other separate threads of control going. You want to take all of their results, put them all together in one place, look at the final results from them, and do something with it. A good example of that is if you have a web app, you do a whole bunch of different queries, and you get the results back from the queries, and you actually go and like, construct a page for, for the web application. right? Okay. So let's, this is my, my motivating example. I'm going to show you the old way of building a web crawler. Um, for those of you who don't know what a web crawler is in the audience, which is a fair thing, uh, the, a web crawler is something that lets you scan the web. What it does is it fetches a web page. It finds all of the links in that web page. Um, it then, and to end the data, it then follows all of those links, and then fetches the data for all of those links, and then follows all of those links, and so on and so on. So it's just this ever-expanding tree of things that it's found to index. Um, and this is how you build a search engine, kind of like Google. Uh, I like this example because it demonstrates a lot. So let's build it together. The first thing you need to do this is to fetch a URL. right? Uh, here's my simple example. I hope you guys, can you see that code OK back there? Can I get a thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah? OK, awesome. So this is a fetch function. Uh, it's really simple. We URL open the URL. We make sure we got a HTTP 200 OK, which means everything's good. We read the data. We assert that we actually got something. We convert the bytes to text, and we return the text. 
Pretty simple. Uh, if you run this in your interpreter, you fetch example.com, you're going to get a nice HTML document back. This is your output. Okay. So far, so good. Extract. This is the next thing you need to do if you're building a web crawler. So this is find all of the URLs on the page, extract them, and then so that you can then go and scan them later. Okay. So this is another function, pretty straightforward. I'm going to talk you through this one a little more slowly. Uh, first step is use that fetch function we just set, declared. Go and fetch that URL. Um, now, I'm using a regular expression here. You probably shouldn't do that. You should probably use beautiful soup or some other things that have been covered at this conference for actual web scraping. But for this demonstration, I'm using a, a regular expression. So I run a regex on the data, the text I got back, matching something that looks like a URL. Um, every time I find something unique, I add it to the set of found URLs. And I just go through the whole document until I get that list of URLs. And then I return back the URL that I, I crawled, the data that I found, and all of the links that I found in that page. OK? Make sense? If you run this function, uh, here's what happens. You call extract on example.com to give you back the URL you just passed, example.com. It gives you back the data for that URL. And then it gives you back the set of links that it found in that page. OK? It's supposed to be easy so far. Now it's going to get a little harder, but I've tried to make this as simple as I can. Uh, a crawl. What is, what is actually the act of crawling? Well, it's a breadth-first search. Uh, breadth-first search is kind of a computer science term. Um, it's different. So what a breadth-first search, so a depth-first search is you start at the root and you go all the way to the leaf and back to the root and up to the leaf and then back to the root and up to the leaf over and over again. A breadth-first search is like a tiering search. You scan all at this level. Then you scan the next level. Then you scan the next level. You go as wide as you can at each stage. So a crawler, if you think about what a web crawler does, it's going to fetch that first URL, example.com. It's going to find all the links there, and it's going to build this next layer of the pyramid. Then it's going to go fetch everything at that layer of the pyramid, all the different URLs, get their data, and then make the next layer of the pyramid above that uh, uh, for all the next set of URLs. Then it's going to go fetch all of those, and then get all the data for those, and then extract all the URLs out of that, and then it'll create the next layer. So it's this buildup from one URL to 10 URLs to 1,000, uh, to 100, to 1,000, to 10,000, exponentially growing. So uh, here's how I would implement a breadth first search uh, using what we have so far. Um, so it's a crawl function. Uh, it takes a list of URLs, um, has a set of results that we're going to fill in. We do a for loop. The for loop is how deep we want to go, how many levels of the pyramid we want to actually have. Um, and what we do, I'm going to define this extract multifunction in just a second. But what we do is we say, hey, I have this set of URLs I want to fetch. Um, go and do extraction on them. Go Fetch them, pull all the URLs out, give me back a batch of things you found. Then we iterate over the batch. We have the URL that we've crawled, the data that we got from it, and all the links in the page. We append what we found to the list of results. And then the key thing here in blue is to fetch extend. That's where we say, this is the next level of the pyramid. Add all the URLs I found to the next level of the pyramid. So then when we go around the loop again, that's the set of URLs we fetch the next time. OK? Does that make sense to everybody? You following me? OK? Read the first search. OK, seems like I got some thumbs up. Cool. All right, so that's the crawl function. Now, extract multi is really dumb. It's just a for loop. Go through every URL to fetch, call extract on it, append it to the, the tuple to the results, and then return the results. Really trivial. The big problem with this function, as you probably can guess, is that it's serial. Every time you call extract, it's just going to go fetch that URL. If you're trying to get 100 URLs, it's going to do them one at a time. If one of those URLs is super slow, everything's going to have to wait for that one super slow URL to go. So this is a naive implementation, but it, but it works. Uh, and if you run this on an example like example.com, you'll get back the URLs, the data, and the set of links that you thought all the way through. There's a bunch of edge cases that I'm not going to go over because it's not important for this talk. Now, here's where things uh, get weird. I want to make this fast, right? That extract URLs function does one URL at a time, and it's uh, it's, it's just really too slow. So how can we make that faster? Now, I'm going to show you one way to make this faster using threads. Um, there's a lot of other ways you can make it faster. You could use uh, multiple processes, sub-processes. You could use sockets to other machines that, that do customized fetching. Um, you could also do um, kind of deferreds or continuation passing style. There's a lot of different types of machinery out there for doing this kind of thing. I think that they all have a similar kind of smell, if you know what I'm saying. 
Uh, and so I'm going to show you with threads, and you can kind of use your imagination for the, the tools you've used. I think also most, most programmers um, have used threads, so they understand what I'm trying to say. So first of all, we have this function called crawl parallel. If you just look at this, this has nothing to do with crawling. This is just a bunch of like, cr like cr code to create objects and hook them together. If you read this function, you're like, what does this have to do with crawling? I don't even understand. It really doesn't make any sense. Um, so what we're doing here is we're creating a queue, which is a, a primitive that lets threads talk to each other. Um, we have this fetcher function. That's going to be our thread that runs. We go and start three of the fetcher threads, so that start call. We then put the first URL, the bottom of the pyramid, we put that in the queue. And then we wait for the queue to empty. That's what that join call does, fetch queue join. So that's going to wait for the, the work to be done by some means. And then when we're done, we uh, return the result. So we're pass we have this result. Uh, function, uh, result uh, variable up here, we're passing it in kind of like a closure into this lambda, which I don't like. It's just gross. But this is how most people actually do this, from, from what I've seen. OK. So what does the fetcher do? This is where it's just crazy. It, I mean, it's so, OK, it's a, it's a thread. That means it runs forever. It has no return value. Um, it's just while true until the, the, the system dies. Uh, and what it does is it gets some piece of work off of this thread. So what do I have to do next? Um, the thread that's, the, the, the work that it has to do says, how deep am I in this pyramid? And what do I need to do? So it basically breaks up that multiple pyramid thing I was describing into like little, little chunky phases, kind of like a depth first search. So we say, oh, am I too deep? Have I gone too far? This is kind of the for loop equivalent. Then we go and extract that URL. We append the result that we found after extracting that URL to this list. That actually relies on the gill. It's a horrible thing. I'm not going to even get into that. But that's what most people in this room have probably done. Uh, then we add all the URLs we found to the queue. And that's that fan out. That's creating the next layer in the pyramid, fanning out one, uh, one fetch into many more fetches in the future. And at the very end, we say fetch queue uh, task done, which says, hey, if you were waiting for me, I'm done now. So back to this thread, uh, the original caller, fetch queue join, that's just waiting for that task done. Anyway, this is way too complicated. It's horrible. I don't, we don't even have to get too far into it, because I, I hate it. Uh, here's the same output, much faster, so that's great. It solved the problem. Now, here's where things get really even worse. That was great for one customer. What if I wanted all of the people in this room to be able to crawl a site all at the same time? How would I implement that? Do I give each of you three fetching threads? Do I give, give each of you one thread, and then you have to wait for your crawls? Uh, it, just, it just doesn't work. I mean, it's, it, the code that I, ha I just wrote, I had to rewrite all of my code to then get to this point where I can make it faster. And if you want to make a concurrent crawl so all of us can be crawling at the same time in one Python program, it gets, it's possible, um, but it's very complex. It's about 200 lines of code from what I wrote. It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, if you read the code, you're, you wouldn't know that you're writing a crawler. Like that's, it's just this thread synchronization primitive. It just so happens to fetch URLs along the way. Um, but I wrote it. It's example number 12 on here in case you want to see it. So I don't, I hate this. So I want to tell you about the new way of doing things. Um, I want to show you how to build a web crawler using uh, Tulip. So the first thing is fetch. Okay, this is where things get really easy. So we're going to go over easy code now. Here's the old way of doing it. You remember this? Very simple. Uh, open the URL, same thing as before. So this is fully synchronous code, and this is fully asynchronous code. So synchronous, asynchronous. Everywhere I do I.O., now I do a yield from. I'm using the AIO, uh, AIO HTTP library, but yeah, nice to Guido. But there's more. Uh, so everywhere that you do I.O., op uh, opening a socket, reading from that socket, you have to do a yield. So I'll tell you what the yield does in a second, but the point is, anywhere you're going to do something that blocks, just do a yield. Extract, same thing. Here was the extract function before, you remember? One line change. I annotate it with async I.O. coroutine, and then every time I do I.O., uh, I yield from that async function. So it looks like synchronous code, but it's actually able to run asynchronously. That's the magic of, of, of Tulip. So how do you do the crawl? This is the function from before, exactly the same way. One line change again, yield from uh, this extract multi-async. So again, just any time I do I.O., I annotate and then do a yield from. 
And then same thing, extract multi. How do I change this to async? Same thing. Okay, you get the pattern, right? Now, this has the same problem, though, that the original code did. This is still a for loop. It's still doing all the fetches in serial. So we actually haven't made anything faster so far. This is just, it's asynchronous enabled, but it's not actually asynchronous. Uh, so let's talk about crawling in parallel. This is where everything got weird with the old case, right? We had to get these threads, and we had to have a queue, and we had to have a lambda, and had this results function, and it was like, it was just a results a list. It was just horrible. We'd be relying on the gill, all this bad stuff. Uh, I want to show you how this works in Tulip. So I, I rearranged this a little bit. This is the same function I just showed you. I just added some white, uh, some white space. Um, so this is the synchronous version of the code, and this is the fully parallelized version of the same code. So it's, it's like four lines. It looks almost identical. And I'm going to go through what's happened here. So when you call a coroutine, uh, what you're actually doing is you're getting a future. A future is a promise that something in the future will give you a result, OK? So that at coroutine decorator that's on this function and all the other ones basically means it'll take your function call and it'll give you back that future. And that future, if you yield from it, you'll wait for the result synchronously. But if you don't wait for it, if you don't yield from it, then you just have this future object. So you can accumulate a list of futures. So in this case, I just append them to a list. So this is fan out. I fan them all out. I can have one URL or 10 URLs or 1,000 URLs or 10,000 URLs. You're really only constrained by memory at this point. So that's fan out, the magic of fan out. The next part is this as completed function. This is built into async IO. This says, hey, here's a group of futures. Give them back to me as quickly as they finish. So they're all running in parallel. Some are going to take 10 milliseconds to finish. Some are going to take one second, or some are going to take 10 seconds. I want to iterate over them in the order that they actually finish. So I can start doing work as soon as it's ready. So I iterate over that. Uh, I go over that iterator with each future, and then I yield from each future. When I yield from that future, I get the result. So I get the result of that original extract async call above. Okay? So I put the futures in the list, and then down below, I uh, wait on the future and actually get the result, put the result on the, on, the list, uh, on, the, uh, on the results list, and then I return all the results. That's fan in. So that's, it's all right here. This is it. And uh, the, the killer thing about this is no changes to any other part of the code that I showed you. The crawl function doesn't even have to know. So if you're refactoring something and you want to go faster, you don't even have to tell your caller. You just go faster. There's no extra machinery to make it uh, composable. Uh, and so same output, much faster, really small delta. Like that is, that is the, the full magic of, of Tulip. It's like right here, fan out, fan in. Uh, one last thing is concurrent crawls, that thing I said that was really hard the old way. So uh, I, you know, 200 lines of code is what it took me. I I've had to put this in GitHub. It like, dro drove me crazy. It was completely legible. Uh, here's a server that will handle like 10,000 clients that will do crawls for all of us individually concurrently, um, that's it. I have my crawl async, and I just yield from it. This is, again, using the AIO HTTP library, but it's, just, it's another coroutine, handle request. I get called one of these for everyone in the room who'd, who'd send me a post. I read from the post data. I pull, so that's I, I yield from because I'm doing IO. I get the URL parameter out. I then call that crawl function we just looked at. The, and that one runs fully parallelized. Um, then I get my response, I write my output to it, and then EOF, and I'm done. So it's trivial to go from a stupid program that does really stupid things to a ridiculously fast concurrent program that does things very quickly. So that is why Tulip matters, and that's why we need to use Tulip. OK. Yeah. So just last piece of follow-up on this, and then I have some time for questions. Um, the, the thing that I noticed is that once you start seeing fan out and fan in, it is everywhere. Like, and maybe it's because once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I'm definitely guilty of that a lot. But uh, I want to just go over a couple more uh, cases of that uh, real quick. So with data, SQL, right? Uh, so here's, here's a SQL statement. You know, I have a customer's table, and I have an order's table. And I want to figure out, like, you know, what is a customer with the largest uh, payments to me, right? So if you do a join, that's fan out. Take 
this smaller table and this larger table and then fan everything across, like a left outer join. That's what you're doing. Uh, and then fan in is group by. Group all of the output rows and then narrow them back down to the customer IDs, okay? So that's the pattern, fan out, fan in. Uh, and then a lot of other languages have come up with like really simple mechanisms for describing this process that are, that are very useful and powerful tools. And so I'm really excited about Tulip because now Tula, like Python has one of these two out of the box. Another powerful abstraction that you probably heard about is MapReduce. Exactly the same thing. It's a powerful abstraction of fan out and fan in. Uh, here's a simple word count MapReduce. Uh, you get a document in, which is the text. You use that same, uh, use a similar regex to pull all the words out. Um, for every word you find, you output one. That's fan out. So every document goes from a document to a million different uh, mapper outputs on, on, map, on the map phase. You shuffle all the words together. You throw them into reduce. You count out how many uh, different uh, counts you saw for each word. Add that up and return that. And that's, that's your reduce function. So map is fan out. Uh, reduce is fan in. And then the last thing uh, is uh, measurement. Um, so histograms, you think about histograms, you have to bucket things. Um, so you have all of your data, you have many different types of things that you want to measure in different types of histograms, or different, um, uh, different types of histograms. So you fan them out into the different, bucket, uh, into the different uh, stats you're counting, and then you fan them in into the buckets that you need to keep track of. Reservoir samples are the same way. Uh, profilers for profiling CPU usage, you, you do tracing function calls so that you fan out all those call sites and you fan them back into usage. And then any, any kind of estimators, Cardinale estimators, are kind of the same thing again. So it's all this theme about fan out and fan in. Uh, OK, so finally, some links uh, to go through. Um, PEP3156, async IO, I definitely think you should check it out. It's a real low-level li lo uh, low library, and people are starting to build on it. And so there's a lot of additional packages that build on it. And that's where it's really going to be useful to everyone here. Um, but it's worth checking out right now and using right now, especially with stuff like AIO, HTTP, which like, make it fully able to be used uh, today. Um, there's even a Python 2.7 backwards compatibility. It's not as nice, but it, it, uh, it's a similar library. It's a backport. But if you want the real magic of it, you have to use Python, uh, Python 3. Um, there's also App Engine's NDB library that Guido uh, built that is uh, similar but different. Um, so I love using that on App Engine if that's where you happen to do things. Um, the C-sharp async and await uh, uh, like, uh, language uh, like operators are really similar to this. And in ECMAScript uh, 7, um, JavaScript uh, 7, their generators and promises work very similarly. Um, there's also a great talk by Rob Pike on concurrency is not parallelism. Um, it's all about Go and how it does concurrency. So if you, if you like this idea and this topic, I definitely think you should check out that talk to really understand uh, from Rob what, what this is all about. And finally, this is where the slides and the code are, and this is where you can find me later. So that's it. Thanks. So if you have any uh, questions, there's a mic right there. I'd love to answer your questions. Um, all of my slides are online on my site or on that GitHub repo. So if you have any other questions, and all of these links are clickable through, through the slides, so if you just Check it out. Uh, yes, Guido. Did you realize that I wrote the web call a much longer line as a major example? So Guido, Guido's question actually was kind of more of a comment. Uh, was did you realize I wrote a web crawler as a motivating example for async IO? No, I had no idea. Uh, so great minds, you know they say. That's uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. Anybody? Oh yeah, is there anybody at the? Yeah, could you? Explain the, what the future object is and kind of uh, how it differs from, say, a generator or something like that. Yeah, so the, uh, the future object, it's the question, yeah, so how, how is it different from a generator? So uh, futures in async IO, there's a lot of different things you can do for it, uh, with it. Um, a future, you can add callbacks to it. Um, you can try to cancel them so they, they stop happening um, at, uh, in the future so they, they actually don't finish. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a handle to work to be done and all these operators for ways to attach to know when is that work done? Actually, I don't want that work anymore. Um, so that's, that's what's contained in there. Uh, the future is a common way of describing all of the different things that different async libraries use. Uh, uh, there was actually a talk earlier today about more of the internals about async IO, and I think that, that maybe you should check out the slides on that for the actual internals. Um, but uh, generators and the coroutines are like sugar on top of that. 
And so what's really interesting also about async IO is it unifies the primitives. So if you want to use Twisted along with these coroutines, along with gevent, the idea is that sometime soon, or even now for testing, you can actually use all of these libraries together in a way that just makes sense uh, between all of them. So that's, that's, that's what these objects are used for. It, it was a great comparison between the traditional way of doing things and the new way. Thanks. Uh, and so do you have any measurements in terms of benchmarks, uh, any rigorous benchmarks as how the tr traditional way did it and performed and what are the, me the, given the same, the Python 2x interpreter and Python 3x interpreter where oh. this new feature is available? Yeah, so I think your, your, your real question is like, what is the overhead of using these tools, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't actually know that. And I think that um, maybe Guido could take that question better than I could. but. Uh, I think that from using uh, things like it in production, like the App Engine NDB library, um, the overhead is, is really low. Uh, I think where you get into trouble is when you have like tens of thousands of future objects just from like memory uh, churn and, and things like that. Um, but in all the practical use cases I've used it in so far, I haven't had any, the performance gains from doing things in parallel have always outweighed uh, any slowdowns from, from using future objects and, and all the allocation that goes with it. Um, I'm sure there are benchmarks on, on the async I/O list, but I'm so not aware. you do use it in production as well. Uh, so we use the NDB library, which is like similar in a lot of ways. Um, I would love to use async I/O in production as soon as soon as I can. So I'm just waiting on getting Python three in production. Very cool. Yep. Uh, so what we're doing, or one of the things we're doing, when we use the ASIC approach, is encoding some of the state of our program into the saved call stacks. So you're sort of losing some interesting state. In your web crawl example, like a progress bar would become more difficult, not impossible, more difficult to implement. Could you just talk about some of the approaches you found useful for reporting state out of these async calls? Yeah. So I think the so yeah I think that the the main thing here is that because I think the way that to, to phrase that is that like in this case where uh, where we kick off a lot of a lot of uh, async calls and a lot of features and we can't really get data out of this coroutine because it's blocking. And I think what you're saying is that you know, if you had a WebSocket that's waiting back there, you kind of want to send some data back up to that WebSocket, some status information or progress bar or whatever, and you can't really escape where you are here. Um, I think that there are some mechanisms built into async I.O. for like global notifications or adding, um, adding uh, callbacks to features and that kind of stuff that can enable you to get these like side channels out so you can kind of get out of the, you can get back to the main event loop and get out of this abstraction of fan out and fan in. Um, I think coroutines are this way, that's true. Uh, but I think the facilities, the lower level facilities provided here enable things like that. And I think that the use cases, we're still just trying to discover use cases like that. I would, I would love to see a library in Python that makes that trivial. So you just say, like, fire and forget this message back up, up the event loop. Um, so I think you should build that, is my, my answer. Yeah, so it's clear that async is helpful. Uh, you know, it's faster because you're getting to, while well, wor you're working and getting data, and you're wake blocking on the I.O. and that, that's happening and you get to do other things. But uh, is, are there any primitives that help also to, um, you know, fire off another process or fire off a thread or something to help get actual CPU bound things working as well without yeah. necessarily sacrificing that, uh, that pass through of the, like the connection, like the socket, for example, yeah, like totally. a router or anything like that? Yeah, so I think that what's cool about all the async I.O. is that you get access back to this event loop, this core event loop. And so you can do things like schedule tasks, schedule callbacks, call me back as soon as it's ready. Um, and so if you want to like go fire off a process and then pull it, you have the primitives that you need to do things like that. So if you wanted to fire something off in another thread and then wait for it in a, in a way that felt good, that actually is compatible with this model by actually hooking into the lower level event loop primitive. So that's, that's, an, that's what I'm talking about. It's like we have a common tool of expressing like, def, like do, starting a task and then pulling for it to finish and then having it finish and then notifying everyone who's waiting. So it, this is the, the simplest example that I think is the most practical. But yeah, it, when you want to do that kind of thing, there, there are facilities built in to get to the event loop to do all that. So definitely check it out. The PEP has it described in there. Is there still a way then to, um, like, in sort of like a web socket example where you're going, you're passing off sort of the, the socket handle to something? Is there still a, a decent way to still use the same model in this ter terms of it's yeah, clear? Yeah, I, I don't you know. know. I exactly understand what you mean by the question. Maybe you can come up afterwards, and then okay. we can go into that. Yeah, thanks. One. Cool. Uh, yeah, when uh, C Sharp dropped with the uh, async await, um, they also had to add uh, pretty much all of the standard I.O. libraries 
these same functions but with async on the end so you know you're dealing with an asynchronous right. function. Is there an analog to that coming out with Python or is there a standard for it or is that not a constraint to have to worry about? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think that's a question for Guido because I, really I don't really know yet. But I mean, when I was reaching for the H like an HTTP library, I wanted to have URL open async, right? Uh -huh. And I, it wasn't there because we're just not that far along yet. But there's an open source library, this AIO HTTP that had it exactly what I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is an open question that I don't understand either, which is when will all of the standard library functions do the right thing in all of these different cases? I would expect that that is the goal long term, yeah. but I, don't, I can't speak for Guido in the project. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Brett, yeah, so Brett Cannon says when we have time. Cool. All right, that's it. So thanks a lot for coming. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Just a quick, just a quick announcement. We.